This is going to be good. I can't freak you away for this. All right, everybody. <laughs> here it is. It's time to welcome to Totally Driven Radio. And I love this saying. The man who sweats glitter and comes confetti, and quite possibly from the greatest band out there today, the one, the only, Mr. Mo Royce Peterson of the band Tragedy. What's going on, Mo Royce? Oh, my God, that's me. Hi. <laughs> How about that? That's you. Yeah. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I am fully aroused. See that? That's because you're totally driven. That's what happens when you listen to Total Gym Radio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See that? So uh, this whole the the whole world of tragedy, this whole band tragedy, like it, it's it, I came across you guys a few years because of the world of YouTube. I was looking through BG's videos and I come across you guys. Like, wow! What I just do you like, think? I, well, I was first off, I was blown away. Because it was like two of my favorite Boy. things. It was like the Ble- the Bee Gees and uh-huh. Hard Rock. And uh-huh. It was a great combination. And I just kind of know how in heaven's name did you guys come up with this whole thing? Well, it's really like a, a Reese's peanut butter cup, isn't it? Like uh, it, we uh, made these two worlds collide and it, it, it feels so good in your mouth. Um, <laughs> you know, it, I... It, you know what it feels like? I'm going to tell you what it feels like, how we came up with it, and then I'll tell you the real story. The way it feels is that we were like stone teenagers hanging out in our parents' basements, like listening to heavy metal but and making fun of the Bee Gees. That's okay. really what it feels like, but that's not the reality at all. We were We were fully grown men when we came up with this idea. And what happened is that um, I was uh, producing an album for Children of the Unicorn um, with the man who uh, became my brother, Barry Glibb, in this band. And we got a a phone call from a promoter who ended up being my uh, brother, Robin Gibbons, in this band, who's no longer in the band. But uh, he said that um, there's this band, Super Diamond, that they're doing a weekend of shows at Irving Plaza, and they're looking for a support band. What could we come up with? And we're like, well, I don't know. We'll call you back in five minutes. So we sat there, and we're, we ate our salads and drank our Diet Cokes. And, um, and you know, we're kind of going through stuff, and we're like, how about a heavy metal tribute to something that's not heavy metal? And uh, one, I think the worst idea was a heavy metal tribute to Anita Baker, because, like, there would be zero audience for that. Um, so uh, yeah. we threw that out, but eventually we came up with the heavy metal tribute to the Bee Gees, and we thought, wow, like, you know, all these amazing disco songs and what they represented in the culture, the whole disco sucks thing. But then, like, the reality of, like, their amazing songwriting and their extensive catalog, too, it, and we're like, this is brilliant. I mean, it was really stupid and kind of impossible. <laughs> we're like, okay, let's do it. And um, and the promoter said, okay, that's fine as long as I can be in the band. So we let him be Robin, and, and like in the Bee Gees, he, he'd just kind of stand there in the middle of the stage with his finger in, the, finger in his ear, and people would wonder, <laughs> what's that guy doing? <laughs> oh. So, I, I mean, w- w- when that happened, like when you turn around and then you tell the guy, I mean, before he becomes Robin, does he think like you guys are like, out of your minds, or is he just like that's a brilliant idea? He thought like we did that it was like a horrible, stupid idea that could be really funny. And you know, honestly, we're like, you know, we booked these shows like, and we didn't even we never played a note or anything. Like we didn't know what was going to happen. And then we figured, oh, this will be fun. This will be fun for a weekend. You know, put this together and. And when we started working on it, it's just all connected. The, 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 everything about it connected. You know, we, we found the right people for it. We found the right clothes for it. Um, and we found the kind of the, the right treatments, you know, musically for it. And right. it connected with, with the audience. And, you know, like we did a whole bunch of these kind of bigger support shows. And it would be just, you know, the, crazy variety of acts that we'd be supporting, you know, from the Aquabats, who have, like, a very 
you know, teenage following to Super Diamond, who's, you know, a, a Neil Diamond tribute band. And, you know, and then, and now we go and play these, like, brutal metal festivals overseas. And, like, everybody can relate and everybody digs it. It's pretty fun. <laughs> That because you yeah you guys were just overseas recently weren't you? Yeah yeah we just got back from the UK uh, about a week ago. Wow, that's freaking awesome. Now how about like uh, you, you mentioned the image? <laughs> I, I mean like it, it's so cra- I, I was telling my co-host Nick I'm like you really just got to see it to believe it because it it, it really just takes that seventies glammy disco look and just mixes it with a hard rock hairband look and it's just so off the wall yeah and plus we're like we work out a lot so we're like super muscular yeah did you notice that? I, I explained that as well i did yeah, yeah. i explained yeah. that as well <laughs> and, and how about like the glitter like there is so much glitter like how much glitter do you guys honestly use? I mean, between all over your bodies, you guys are like, do you have like glitter cannons or something like that? I mean, there's just glitter flying all over the stage. You know, the thing is, like, it never goes away. It like it just gets recycled naturally somehow. You know, what what does their shirt say? We we sweat glitter and we come confetti. That's about it. You know, like I don't know. Right. If we, you know, since the first week we started the band, I don't know if we've actually purchased anything new because have you ever tried to get rid of confetti that's in your hair or like glitter that's on your body it just will not go away yeah it's nearly impossible yeah now you said uh you guys did like a you know the fir- them first few shows now what did like uh what did the crowd think like when you guys started this for them first few was- shows it was really cool. The, the first show we ended up doing, we, we ended up getting a, another show before um, we did those with uh, Super Diamond. And it was at um, BB King's, and it was with the Aquabats, and it was sold out. And we took the stage and, like, you know, started going, <laughs> dressed how we were. And, like, it, the Aquabats audience is, you know, like a teenage audience and they just responded right away and there was a mosh pit when we were playing Night Fever and like it was amazing um, and you know so many different bands we you know we did a show with uh, with Murphy's Law early on in okay. New York City and um, <laughs> there, there were a couple hecklers there who got thrown out and that's that would happen that would happen in, in the early days, and and we would make the most of it. I mean, it's kind of fun when you get heckled. But um, I remember, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know Murphy's Law, but they're um, you know, yeah, New York, the old school New York hardcore band, a lot, lot of skinheads, um, you know, and they're following. And um, I remember about a month later being at a bar, and these two skinheads walk over to me. You know, they're shaved head. Uh, red suspenders, you know, the white T-shirt and all that, and and they walk over to me and my heart starts pounding a bit. I'm like, what's going on here? And they say, hey man, are you in tragedy? I'm like, yeah. You guys are fucking awesome. <laughs> and then I saw them like, I've seen them for years, like coming back to our show. So it's like anybody, like our our concerts are like the cross section of anybody who went to a concert this year. Wow. <laughs> uh, do you guys come to Philly at all? Yeah, yeah, we haven't played Philly in about a year. Um, but I'd like to get back there. We were playing there regularly for a while, played the truck and TLA. Really? Um, yeah. Where the hell have I been? I don't know, dude. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure this out. I, I yeah, I, I, you guys got to come back to Philly soon. Now, how about like, uh, I, well, since Barry's the only gib uh, remaining, have you guys ever like heard any words from Barry, like that he's heard you guys, or not from Barry directly? We were in touch with uh, different family members. It, it was. Um, uh, I think Ra 
Robin's daughter and son-in-law were, are big fans of the band, and they got in touch with us early on. And yeah, they they were just goofy about it. Um, but I don't. But yeah, we haven't had direct contact uh, with with Barry. I'd love to love to know what what he would think. And I hope that that they take it the right way. I mean, we're you know we're uh, sending up everything, you know. Um, right. And and we we truly appreciate the music that we're doing. Um, I mean, we're we're making fun, but we're mostly making fun of ourselves. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, the 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 source material that that we get to work with, and you know, we've moved well beyond the Bee Gees too. Actually, our our third right. album has no no Bee Gees songs on it, and uh, the fourth album, which we just released, it has it has an Andy Gibbs song and and a Bee Gees song on it too. Yeah, I mean, that was the, the one thing, too, I guess you guys really didn't even think of when you started. Like, you think, oh, yeah, we're going to do this whole Bee Gees thing. And, and then it's like, oh, well, what happens when we run out of the Bee Gees songs to to screw around with? Well, yeah, you know, there was that. I mean, we weren't looking beyond, like, a couple shows, really. But then we thought, wow, you look at the Bee Gees before disco. And, right. you know, they had all these songs all these albums and hit songs too, but people didn't right. really know. I didn't know. I didn't know that the Bee Gees wrote to love somebody. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, di- I didn't know so much about them. And then the, the more I found out, the more I just loved them even more. Um, sure. But the thing is like, we, we were like, okay, well that that's our thing. That's our brand. We have to stick with it. And we would start to, Play our versions of lesser-known Bee Gees songs live, and we may love them. And then, you know, if, if the audience doesn't know what the, what we're doing a spin on, a lot of times they right. look at it like, "What is this?" So, right. so then we, we we started doing more like A-list, you know, '70s soft rock and uh, and uh, other disco songs. Cool. Now, how about um doing these songs like? I'm sure you played in, uh, you know, original bands or whatever before you guys started doing this. Do you think it's uh, harder to turn around and write a song from scratch, your own music, compared to doing these mashed up versions that you guys are doing? I don't. And uh, actually, this is the first, you know, cover or tribute band that I've ever been a part of. Um, And it is, I got to say, it is, equally challenging to uh to start off with something and you know most of the time you know sometimes you know we'll come up with oh let's do that song and just kind of strap on the guitars and it just pours right out but right. most of the time like you know these are songs that weren't meant to be played as heavy metal so like you have to really really work on them and uh, and you know there are a lot of heavy metal artists who've done this before, like uh, right. Ozzy Ozzy and Dweezil Zappa have a version of "Staying Alive," and you know I love those guys. I mean Ozzy is totally my hero, but their version of that song is so bad. Um, and that's to me that's kind of the proof. It's not like you know just the idea. It's you know it's the execution too. Yeah, I, I mean when I, when I hear like stuff like that, whether I mean you guys or another band doing like st- different songs, like different versions of you know these classic hits, I think to myself like, wow, like I, I think that would be actually harder than sitting and writing your own original music. Yeah, it is sometimes, and especially also because it's not open ended. That the interpretation we're going to do with it, you know, the interpretation has to be metal. Um, and metal right. is a wide open, wide open field. You know, you have you know the the eighties, you know seventies, eighties hair metal and stuff like that, and that's much more poppy than what a lot of, a lot of people can even consider metal. Um, so there's you know, but but that is that does really restrict like the the range of the interpretation. You know, right. Now, how about, uh, I mean, uh, you guys have done four albums now. Your last, uh, the latest album came out recently. I guess it was, uh, what, about a month ago? A month and a half ago? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and that's got 18 songs on it. So, I mean, you guys have like a nice sized uh, catalog going for you. Like, is there one that you like is like your ultimate favorite? Like the one you live to play every night on stage? Oh wow! You know, there's I have favorite recordings and I have favorite songs to play live. And you know, one of one of my favorite recordings we've ever done is. Um, Woman in Love, which is a, a Barbara Streisand song that um, that Barry Gibb wrote with her, and and the I believe the the Bee Gees produced that that whole album with Barbara Streisand, and uh, yeah, we turned that into this just majestic epic. Um, another, and then but we don't play it live. Anymore. We, we played it live for a few years, but uh, uh, now we have our, our big, <laughs> our big majestic epic live after that, and it's on our uh, our album "Death to False Disco Metal." Um, uh, it's total eclipse of the heart, and uh, for a few years we we ended every show with that, um, and that was fun. We, we'd always bring out like a bunch of ladies from the audience. Uh, just to be, uh, be the last song of the night, and it'd just be a, you know a party on stage. Um, but then w- this last tour, uh, you know, we try to mix it up, and uh, you know, we're we're doing that. And it, <laughs> we uh, on our latest album, we did a version of YMCA, and that's like kind of been on our minds basically since we stopped doing exclusively Bee Gees songs, but we just never came up with an arrangement that really connected, you know, that sounded metal enough and was engaging, you know, fun enough. But for this album, we came up with it. And and uh, we took it out on the road and played it for the first time and uh, our, our first date of the UK tour in Oxford. And we put it last in the set. We're like, yeah, you know, even if it sucks, you know, people are going to be drunk and they'll be fine. And <laughs> the reaction to it was just crazy. Like we didn't, we didn't even play it that well because it was our first time playing it. But it was just like people went crazy for it, and that's the way it was every night on tour. And we're like talking to each other, like, why don't we just play that song like only? You know, that should be the whole set. We just play YMCA over and over again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was only a matter of time before you guys had to get, like, uh, due to village people. Oh, I know. And, we, you know, we get compared to them all the time. Um, you know, we're just this eclectic bunch of weirdos. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. I, God, I love the village people. Like, <laughs> I did. I, you know, there, there's this really foggy childhood memory for me. And then, like, when um, when we started working on the song, I'd watch some of their videos, and oh my God, they just make me smile. They're so good. <laughs> they, they they have to. I mean, I, I remember being a kid too. Like. Uh, it was the late seventies, you know, when that stuff was going on, and getting them. It was like a, such a weird, like my, my record collection at the time was like Kiss, Saturday Night Fever, Grease, and The Village People. I mean, it was like all over the place. And Sean Cassidy, I was like all over the place as a kid. <laughs> you would be the the ideal candidate for a tragedy fan. Then. See that? That that's why I like you guys so much. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it, it was a it was a, a kooky time and like in pop music, you know. It, it was great though. Um but yeah, the whole like the the surge of disco and then the hatred of disco that followed it. That right. was crazy. And and people I mean it that lasted for I mean, we started this band what, in two thousand eight? And people were still <laughs> allergic to disco at that point. Like really, you know, people. Were, yeah, people were like, still like, you know, it, it was just still this this joke. You know, they're just so ostracized. Um, they, you know, the uh, Saturday Night Live, like the, the Barry Gibb talk show, like 
you know, um, that's just how, how everyone viewed it, you know. They were just like, uh, you know, Bee Gees and all that just good stuff, what a joke. And then, um, you know, something finally happened where, like, people were like, oh, wow, this is actually kind of the best dance music ever made. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> well, I, I also, too, I guess you guys can almost kind of look at it like uh, the band Tragedy, you guys have lasted longer than the disco era. Wow. I, man, you just blew my mind. <laughs> uh, and you're getting bigger and bigger. I know. We're huge. 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 Especially uh, the new album came out. It's called the Solo Albums, which is a, a classic takeoff of the band I mentioned, Kiss. Mm-hmm. And uh, you guys had the uh, like a huge breakthrough with the first single and video, uh, and, the old Grease yeah. song, You're the One I Want. Uh, it started yeah. trending everywhere. I mean, that had to blow you guys away. That was uh, that was pretty crazy to watch. Um I think, uh, you know, we released it like we did our, our previous video um, for It's Raining Men. And, you know, put it on Facebook and sent it to our mailing list. And we're watching it. And it's like, you know, watching the numbers. It's like, oh, cool. We got, you know, five, six thousand, ten thousand 10,000 hits in the, you know, first few days or something like that. And we're like, oh, wow, that's great. And then um, something happened and, like, USA Today picked it up, and Dangerous Minds, and then VH1, and like all these, all these blogs and major blogs were picking it up, and it was just spreading like wildfire, and it was, it was pretty crazy to watch. Um, wow! And, now, uh, did you, you know, guys it, like it, see? Did you see like a spike in like sales or any or even we, like we followers and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was like that. I mean, we had, in one day alone, we had 100,000 views. Um, and, you know, it, it was is being written about by all these blogs and websites and everything. But then it was being shared by everyone. Um, right. Kind of thing where, like, you know, you look at VH1's Facebook page and, you know, they have their, their post about you know, one of their own TV shows, and it gets, you know, 50 shares or something like that. And our video gets 5,000 shares from, <laughs> you know, from, uh, from VH1. And that's just that's just one thing. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's really funny to see that happen because we weren't like, this is the ultimate thing that's going to break out. We're like, you know, just kind of going about our business. I mean, this is what we do. Um, you know, we... we Make awesome music and and some sweet videos. And, you know, it's funny that this this connected uh, so much with people. That's awesome. Now, do you guys have a like a, a next video single planned, or we we have a couple things in mind. Um, you know, we could do a, a, an amazing video for YMCA. I gotta say, and um, we have a. Um, a version of Sweet Caroline that's that's kind of uh our version is, is a bit gothic. It's a bit right. dark. We we put we put the verse into a minor key and have a big like uh church organ in there, like cathedral kind of sound. Um and uh I think like a a real gothic version, like a, a true blood kind of meets Neil Diamond thing, uh, <laughs> would be pretty sweet. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> That's I mean, like with each song, it's like different, and there's just so many different ways you guys can go with all this stuff. Well, we like to like to keep it moving, like to keep it fresh, you know. Right, and, and you got it. I mean, beside this even happening, um, when that when that started trending and all. How important do you think the the whole video thing has been to you guys? Well, um, you know, in in general, 
in general, like we made our first video back, basically back when we started the band. We we made a we kind of pieced together uh, a live video or live footage for um, for our, our studio track of "Staying Alive." Um, right. And then we did something for "You Should Be Dancing." Um, and then we did a uh, video for "It's Raining Men." And then this, um, and it's it really helps reach people. It helps people understand the band better. I mean, right. the, the music, the music itself, you know, definitely hooks some people. But you know, when, when you get the the visual aspect to, um, I think that that really draws people in. Um, and it, it, hopefully, we can. You know the success of this last video, we can build on that, and 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 we realize that that's kind of the thing that's gonna draw draw in bigger numbers of people is right. doing crazy videos. Yeah, without a doubt. I I tell everybody, I like uh, every musical guest we have, like especially if they're doing videos or even if they're if they're not doing, I'm like. I think video is more important nowadays than the days of MTV because the world of YouTube, it can be played at any time or shared at any time. It's not yeah. like you have to sit in front of a TV and wait for them and hope they play it. Now it just, yeah. you know, it's on demand for anybody at any point. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it, it, it's... It, and it also, it, there's so much at your fingertips and... Right. You know, the the... the Clearer you can deliver, you know, the more directly you can deliver your your thing, uh, you know, the better your chances are. Absolutely. Now, how about you had mentioned uh, earlier, like, um, you know, people, some people have given you flack about the whole thing. How about, like, uh, other, like, your peers and people in other bands? Have anybody, like, been cross with you guys or? Uh, not to our faces. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes we we hear like, you know, oh, you'd be a great support band for this or that, and um, oh, but they they won't have a tribute band, and it's like, do you know what we do really? Do you really call us a tribute band? I mean, we're like a tribute band that has four albums out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Now, how about like uh, like uh, bigger bands? Like when you said you were doing a, a festival over, you know, overseas. When you're doing like these festivals, and that, what's the reaction from the other bands? Uh, <laughs> mostly very positive. I mean, it, we we played these festivals. One is called Bloodstock in in the UK, and one is called Summer Breeze. We played Summer Breeze twice. Summer Breeze sounds like it'd be like a you know, soft rock festival, it's like totally brutal metal, like the whole weekend. And Bloodstock is too, as you might imagine. Um, sure. You know, this this is like Iron Maiden would be pussies at, at the <laughs> um, And uh, <laughs> I remember <laughs> we, we heard one of the bands say at Bloodstock, when they saw us dressed up going to the stage, we heard them say, how do they expect to be taken seriously when they're dressed like that? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, exactly. But what's funny is that they're all dressed up too, you know? But, yeah, uh, this is true. But the, the reaction from, I, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, if we did like the equivalent here in the U.S. of like a brutal metal festival. I don't know if it would be the same as, as in the UK and Germany. I mean, UK, like, you know, the their connection with rock and roll is like, I don't know, man, the, the metalheads seem to be, uh, I mean, they're, they're very accepting of us. Um, you know, they they embrace the, the humor of it all. Um, right. Um, and, you know, our experience in Germany was, was like that too. Um, but, yeah, I... I don't know. I get I get the sense that in the U.S. Uh, there'd be there'd be more haters, but I mean, you know, they're going to be haters 
anywhere. And sure. Like, you know, even if, you know, 10% of the crowd hates you and 90% loves you, like, you know, then we're, we're doing better than Justin Bieber. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I you know, I totally agree that, like, I mean, you hear, like, I mean, all the stuff I see online and all, and then talking with uh, different acts each week, um, when they go over to Europe, it's like, just what you said, like the the crowds are more accepting, and I, I gather the way uh, it's got to be they're, they're more dedicated and supporting of the bands compared to here in the U.S. It's just it's not there like it used to be. Well, we we have a lot of experience uh, touring the U.K. Um, not so much we toured a little bit in Germany, mostly the, 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 that festival. Um, but as far as the U.K. goes. I think there's definitely a cultural difference. And, you know, think of all the amazing bands, the amazing rock bands that have come out of that country. And it's a, sure. you know, it's a it's a small country compared to this. And they, there's just kind of a an ownership of rock and roll there. And the, the venues are, um, you know, usually 14 and up or 16 and up. I mean, drinking age is 18, but, you know, teenagers oh, okay. can get in these venues. And it's, you know, especially with an act like ours, we really get all ages. I mean, we get 14-year-olds to their, you know, and their parents, and we get right. we, we get we get 35-year-olds and their parents come out. Um, and it just, you know, it, while you go to and then even festivals there. You know, I, I remember we were playing a, at a festival in the UK, and Motorhead was the headliner, and I was standing there, like, you know, kind of stage side um, by the barricade, and um, and I see this, you know, red mohawk kind of get passed through the crowd and then tumble over the barrier. And, and then, you know, the guy turns around to, you know, walk away, and it's this, like, 65-year-old man. <laughs> like, that's that's the UK for you, you know. It's it's wow. people of all ages just rocking their balls off. You know, it, it's weird too. Like when you said that about the UK, like you know, with with uh, the bands that have come out of that small country, like I I've instantly thought to myself too off the bat, like wow, like I never thought of it that way. Like you probably have two of the biggest bands of all time, uh, the Beatles and the Stones, that have come out of that country. And really, what real other bands from America have compared to it? That, in yeah. that magnitude. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you do have, like, those two giants. Um, I mean, the U.S. has some giants of their own, too. But, um, you know, uh, but then it, it, when it first struck me, is I think the first city we ever played in the U.K. was Sheffield. And this is a city I'd never heard of before. And um the, the Leppard's hometown. Uh, right, Def Leppard, Human League and uh Arctic Monkeys. It, you know, it's just like, oh, here here are like some huge legendary bands coming out of the very first city that, that you're playing in that you never heard of. And it's just kinda like that all over the place, you know. <laughs> like you know, like just and it's it's so small it's like it's as if like you know all the all of america's most legendary bands just came from new england or something like that you know it's just like right you know there aren't there aren't that many people and then like the you know the the just the geography it's you know everything is so close together there um yeah and they they own it i mean it's that they own rock and roll. I mean, it's it, it's funny to say that because they kind of took what was invented in this country, um, but uh, you know, they, they just feel a connection to it. I think here it's it's much more diverse musically. Like you know, there's you know, especially now. I mean, you look at pop music. Like it's just not. There's hardly any rock and roll at all. You know, it's you know just hip hop and and the, the, even the pop that exists, there's very little, like, very few live in, or real instruments being played. Um, right. And, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, 
you know, I, I, I love, you know, I love Prince. Prince is one of my favorite artists, but, you know, and, and a lot of that stuff is, you know, synthesized, but, man, then he can play the hell out of the guitar, <laughs> you know? Yeah, this is true. It, it's funny, too, like, when I think of Prince now, because he seems to, like, he's, he's kind of, like, going in, like, a heavier or darker direction, and I think to myself, like, he, like, for the last 20 years has been, like, under the radar, and the person who kind of, like, stole his style and everything to a point, Lenny Kravitz has soared for the last 20 years. Yeah, it's it's really weird like that, you know. It, it, Prince it was so successful for so long, and then people just started taking him for granted. You know, it, it's like with any Prince album that comes out, if there were someone else's name on it, it would make a big splash, um, which is just ironic. It's you know, strange because, you know, he's such a big star, and you'd think that, you know, his next album would make a big splash, but it doesn't really work that way for him. Right. So, all right, so uh, what are the plans for the rest of the year you guys got lined up? Well, um, I think your next show's in Boston on May 2nd. Um we're uh, doing some more U.S. dates. I haven't announced them yet. Um, and, uh, yeah, we really want to do a couple more videos and unleash those on the public. Definitely. Got to. Huge. More trending yeah. times ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you guys definitely got to come back to Philly. Man, I'd love to go back to Philly. We we had, you know, we were playing there regularly for a while, and had a always had a great time there. So let's make that happen. Hey, I'll make that happen. I'm gonna start ruffling feathers out there. There you go. So, all right. So uh, let's get the plugs out there. The album, the solo albums, is out now. Where can everybody get that? Uh, you can get get the CD from our website, which is let's make tragedy happen dot com. Uh, it's also available on you know, iTunes and Amazon, your digital outlets. Nice. And the website is let's make tragedy happen dot com. That's right. And what else? Social media. On Facebook, same thing. You know, if if you Google tragedy, you'll probably come up with Shakespearean tragedy, um, <laughs> and or if you put it, if you you know search it in the dictionary, you come up with the antonym of comedy. So if you get lost <laughs> while you're on the internet, just think the opposite of comedy. And tragedy, and you'll find us. You will find us. I found you. Everybody else can find you. And I'm sure a lot of people are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a lot of uh, a lot of stupid people out there, but there's also a lot of smarter people out there. So, well, well you know, you know but, what I say about tragedy is that you got to be smart enough to get it and dumb enough to like it. Well, there you go. So I, I'm stuck in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Mo Royce, I want to thank you so much. This has been awesome. Like I said, I, I'm going to start uh, reaching out and ruffling feathers in the area. We got to get guys. You guys got to come back to Philly. Yeah, man, ruffle those feathers. Let me uh, let me uh, see what I can do. I'm gonna, I, I got to yeah, I got feathers to ruffle. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I want to thank you so much. And uh, as we're letting you go, uh, I'm going to ask one thing. If you can just cut me a quick ID. You know, this is Mo Royce Peterson of Tragedy, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. This is Mo Royce Peterson of Tragedy, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. Awesome. Thank you so much. And on that note, we're going to play that song. We're going to play that All trending right. song for everybody so they can hear it. it. They want to hear the music. They don't want to hear me babble anymore. So Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much, and I'll be in touch, and I uh, hope to see you guys soon.
All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. Take care. All right, right, everybody. There he is. Mo Royce Peterson, the band Tragedy. Are you ready? Crank it up, because here it is. And you're the one that I want.